Today, we talk about a software upgrade that has the community hot and bothered. That's right, the newest Pico 8 version. Hey! Mm. Hi everybody, hi, this is Christian from LazyDevs Academy. Today, we are not talking about Picotron. I wanna talk about Picotron too, but today our topic is the newest Pico 8 version. I wanna just talk about because if we go to Picotron space, we're not gonna leave <laughs> for a while, right? So I wanna like slip in uh, this video about the newest update of Pico 8, which is uh, version 0.2.6b. It's a small update, but there are some substantial uh, features that I want to go through. Uh, I've been accused of making these update videos a bit too long, so this time around we're gonna try to keep it nice and tight. Let's jump straight in. In fact, let us cut straight to the chase. One of the biggest new features and something that kind of invalidates one of my videos. <laughs> is the ability to do inverted draw operations. Broadly speaking, the idea is that if you fill, you know, you could fill a circle or a rectangle, right, with color. Now what you can do is you can draw a circle or a rectangle, but don't fill the inside of the circle, but the outside, fill everything else except from the circle. And that wasn't possible before and I did a whole video about, you know, listing all those different techniques of achieving this effect. Uh, but now it's possible to do that in Pico 8 natively. So let's get started. So we're gonna install some demos. We're gonna go to the demos, load jlp.p8 uh, like this. Now let's scroll all the way down to uh, where we draw, like here. So let's draw a, like a circle. So we're gonna go circ, fill, uh, we put it in 64, 64, the circle is going to be 92 in size and it's going to be color number 14, which should be pink. Too big. Right, 92 is a little bit too big. Uh, it's a radius, right? So let's go 48. And bam, we have a huge pink circle. So now, how do we make this inverted? We want the outside to be pink, not the inside, right? Well, it's actually surprisingly complicated. First of all, we need to poke. So we need to poke an address that's going to be 0x5f34. And then we're going to poke a 0x2 in there. And then we're going to run this. Nothing changes. So there is a two-step process. So first you need to poke it and that turns on the functionality in general. But then you also need to play around with the color. So right now the color is 14, and you need to add something to that color, a number. And there's the multiple ways of doing this. We can just add 600, 111. And now we get the inverted circle. So yeah, now you can have like this inverted effect like in Super Mario World where you go or you can do things like in Zelda, for example, where you are in the dark dungeons and there's like a, a tight circle around you so you can only see the uh, surroundings nearby to simulate the idea that you are in a dark room, right? Now this doesn't actually invalidate my video completely that I did. Um, the video that I did about this subject actually uh, shows off some really cool advanced techniques that can do some things that even this native implementation cannot achieve. However, this is actually really nice and really cool and you can do a lot with it. So for example, we could draw multiple circles on top of each other to kind of like maybe fade out the board of the circle. For example, something like this where you, you know, to turn this thing on, you turn on a fill pattern, draw a tighter circle first with this, with this kind of dithering fill pattern, and then draw a bigger circle with just opaque uh, black, and that gives you kind of like this dithering fade out on that circle. You can even have multiple levels. There's a lot of cool things that are possible with this. Now, just to clarify, there is like this poke that we need to do at the beginning. And that poke, right now, I'm doing this every frame. I'm doing this in a draw function, but this doesn't have to be in a draw function. This also can be all the way up in init, and you really only need to poke this once. You don't have to poke it every frame. Now, in the documentation, it actually doesn't add a number. What it actually does is it does a or, like a pipe, and then it uses a hexadecimal number, so 0x1800. That's the same thing. I think Zep prefers the hexadecimal because it's slightly easier to understand, you know, the, the bytes that are being shifted here. And that kind of like ties into like this whole question of 
why this specific address like what and why do we have to poke in two and not like something else and why do we have to do an or with this very specific number like these are very specific things that we need to do in order to achieve this effect where are all these numbers coming from now i did some digging and <laughs> i uncovered some operation some functionality about pico8 that i did not know about i will explain this it's very nerdy so if you're really in just interested in you know the new features then feel free to skip this section for everybody else let's see how how deep this rabbit hole goes. Right, so first let's look at Memsplore and let's explore exact that location that we're talking about. We're poking to turn this functionality on. So this is Memsplore, this is my program that I can use to kind of like, it's available in BBS. You can use this to kind of like explore the memory map of Pico 8. Uh, this is the entire memory of Pico 8. And you can see that um, down here, we have like this, these gr two green dots. That's the uh, area that deals with a draw state. And here's like the, the thing that we need to poke in order to turn on this new feature. And if you go there, you see it says pattern IPI color switch. This used to be something that all was already there before. This is a functionality that was there before and I completely missed it. Or I didn't understand it and just like <laughs> ignored it, so to speak. So this was a good opportunity to rediscover this new functionality. Yes, there is a API color switch thing um, that you could have turned on before, but now the new functionality piggybacks on this API color switch. What does that do? Well, it does a lot of things. Bottom line, this is a way to do kind of like um, inline fill patterns and some other small effects. So instead of having set up a fill pattern with fill P and then turn it off again, you can just do it in directly inside the color number. So we have like this little code here, I'm just drawing two shapes, like a circle and a square. And let's say I want to apply a fill pattern to the circle. I would do something like fill P and then a, a fill pattern. Let's use this one and then, and then, and then turn it on and draw the circle. But if I do that, the circle and the square are obviously fill patterns. That means I have to turn off the fill pattern, something like this. And now the circle has a fill pattern and the square doesn't. Now this is fine and Danny, this works fine, but you know, some of us, some of us are built different. Some of us have special needs <laughs> and those needs are tokens. <laughs> And yeah, like every time I turn on a fill pattern, that's three tokens gone, and then you have to turn it off. That's six tokens every time I use a fill pattern somewhere. That's a lot of tokens that we need to use. And it's also like lots of lines and text and so forth. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just like define the fill pattern here directly in the circ fill? Like if that just worked without having to set it up and turn off again, right? Well, that is exactly what this color API kind of thing does. So first of all, we, we poke this again in the init. Your x5 f34 comma. And now uh, here you can uh, supply it with different parameters. You can po actually poke different things in here. Previously, the way you would do is you would just poke in one and that would just turn it on. But now you can also poke it with two. That just turns on the inversion that we just talked about, but it doesn't turn off on the regular stuff. And if you want to turn on both, then you poke it with three or 0x3, I guess. It's the same thing, it's hexadecimal. Now, the, the color here actually encodes a lot of information about how a fill of a shape plays out, including even the fill pattern. So we can actually remove the fill pattern stuff. We can just get rid of that. Now, if you run this, obviously, <laughs> It's all back to solid fill, but now we can do smart stuff to the color and encode a lot of information in there. There is a cheat sheet that I took directly from the manual, and this tells us all of the cool things that are possible now. All right, so this is a hexadecimal uh, format of this number, and so we're gonna switch completely to hexadecimal now because I think this is a little bit easier. So we're gonna go zero X. Now the first digit here, that's just like a global turn on for the color. Like the, the color doesn't have this first digit set to one, then everything else will get ignored. So we have to turn this on. The second color, that is a transparency, like you can turn on and off the transparency of the fill pattern. Not really that important for us right now. This is um, apply, making it apply to sprites afterwards too, because we're basically um, turning on the fill pattern and that will, subsequent draw operations will also have that fill pattern 
Um, and this will apply that to fill uh, to sprites as well if the second digit is set to two. And if the second digit is set to four, it will also apply the secondary color palette. There's like all of the stuff that is uh, possible with fill patterns and secondary color palette and sprites and so forth. All of this is also toggable inside a single number by just changing a digit to a different number. And this also includes uh, the inverted drawing. So yeah, this is the... <laughs> This is the number that we're talking about, 1,800 that will turn on the inverted drawing. So in, in addition to fill patterns, you can also do the inverted drawing. Now the last two, or like the, the smallest two digits, um, that's actually the, the color. So let's set this to 12, but it's hexadecimal, right? So it's going to be 0, A is going to be 10, B is going to be 11, C is going to be 12. So it's, we want to still have blue, right? And then 0 is going to be the second color that's going to be black. And now dot. And now the um, digits behind the comma, behind the point, right? Those digits are actually the encoded uh, fill pattern, uh, encoded in hexadecimal. And again, this is one of those things where you have to look it up. There's a lot of fill P tools out there. This one is on itch.io by developer Sean. And uh, yeah, you can just draw your fill pattern here, different, different colors, and it uh, results like in a lot of like codes that you can put into Pico 8 to encode this fill pattern. Uh, what we are, for example, interested in is this here. That's the hex sum. It's Sasa. 5A, 5A. Okay, let's try that. So 5A, 5A, Sasa. Let's, let's run this. And... You see, it worked. So now we have like this checkerboard pattern applied to our circle. Now, as I said, this actually changes the fill pattern. So that's why the rectangle also has the fill pattern. So now, obviously, something we could do is we could do fill P and turn it off. And then the rectangle has no fill pattern. But of course, if we want to turn it off, like with this built-in function, with this inline function, we just paste it in here. And uh, instead of Sasa, we're going to say 0, 0, 0, 0, basically, uh, fully filled fill pattern and that turns the fill pattern off again just using the colors within those fill function those rect fill functions and i don't have to mess around with fill p anymore very useful if you want to eke out those tiny little you know advantages in tokens also probably very useful for tweet cards is it now called x cards or mastodon cards Moving on, so now a new function as that we have as well is we can remap the sprite sheet memory to different places. We now have four different places in addition to the regular fifth one that we can map in the sprite sheet space to, essentially giving us five times the amount of sprite sheet space. That's a lot. So allow me to demonstrate this thing that you see here. That is basically the map of the entire Pico 8 memory. We have the upper portion, the upper rectangle, big rectangle. That is the um, default uh, Pico 8 memory map that we just saw in Memsplore. This is the regular memory. And at some point, we got a second chunk of memory unlocked at the bottom there that is basically empty most of the time. And we can do whatever we want to do this memory. It's just empty memory. It's just free real estate. Until now, most of the time, the things that we could map into that memory would be uh, the map space. We could just have like a huge map down there, just like that fills that entire space. But something we can do now is we can map sprite sheet space to that huge chunk of memory. And in fact, we can map it onto four different places in that chunk. I encoded them in colors, you can see them. So there's like the gray strip on the, on the top, there is the dark red strip down below, another gray strip, and all those four segments are complete full, you know, 255 sprites of memory. Each one of those strips is its own memory bank, so to speak, its own sprite sheet bank that we can use. Here is how it works. I am a talented artist. Look at this guy. He is very happy. <laughs> and he's not the most beautiful guy in the world, but he will be. Look at this. Ah, beautiful. Right, so let's draw this to the screen. Like this. So we're now drawing this sprite to the screen. Now let us do the following. We do a mem copy here. This is an example from um, from Zep's post. We're gonna do a mem copy, and we're gonna copy 
to the location, to this otherworldly, you know, second memory space that was unlocked not long time ago. Uh, this is starts as 8000, as hexadecimal 8000. That's the address where that part starts in the second uh, square at the bottom. There, we're going to copy uh, the sprite sheet, which starts at zero, and it is the size 2000, right? We're going to copy that over. So now we copy the sprite sheet into this new space. Now we're going to clear our normal sprite sheet, 0x2000, right? So if I run this now, you, you see we're drawing the sprite, but the sprite is empty because we cleared the sprite sheet. But we have now a copy of that sprite sheet in this other space. So now we can remap using poke, 0x80. So this is this, this is the memory address that stores, that remembers where the sprite sheet is. And this is the location of the sprite sheet. Now it's abbreviated, it's not the full 8000, it's just 80, and then it adds the zeros automatically, but that's how it works. If you run this, it crashes. <laughs> so yeah, that's a bit of an issue right now. Uh, I've been working with this a little bit. I did some experiments and my experience is, is that this is a very unstable function at this moment. It crashes quite a lot when you use this. And it's not like, you know, I. it always crashes. It's difficult to reproduce it. But if I work with this for a while, then I inevitably will get a lot of crashes. It's good that we captured this because I was trying to record this and it never worked when I tried to record this. But yeah, here is the program again. Let's save this, let's run this, and now this works. Now I know this demonstration is not the most impressive one, so let me show you something else. All right, this is a more advanced demonstration, but it, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. There's not much happening here. All we do here in this demo is we're drawing the entire sprite sheet to the screen. We're just drawing the entire sprite sheet to the screen. What kind of sprite sheet do I have? I have the sprite sheet from my current uh, tutorial project, advanced shmup tutorial. I just have the, my current sprite sheet in there and just save this and run this. And it just it just draws that to the screen. But we do something else as well. Here uh, above here, I'm loading sprite sheets from other cards and I'm dumping it to this new space, to those four slots in this new space. At 8,000, at A, thousand at c thousand at, at e thousand in hexadecimal right those four slots in the new space new memory space and i have the best of my games that i created over the years i have my chance sweet buns i have pork like i have high stakes and i have uh, even the breakout the original breakout hero and uh and i'm putting them in those new spaces and then with just pressing the right button i remap the sprite sheet to those new spaces so i can flip through five sprite sheets in a blink of an eye. Saving it, running it, don't crash. <laughs> okay, in the top left corner, you see the address that we're currently reading from the sprite sheet from. So this is a regular sprite sheet. This is my chance sweet buns at 8,000. This is pork light at A, thousand. This is high stakes at C, thousand. We have five sprite sheets in one Pico 8 card. The only problem that you really have is how to get that information in there in the first place. Because like we can only have one sprite sheet here in the editor, right? Like this is this is the problem, this is the challenge here, right? We can create a sprite sheet here in the editor and save it into the cart in the editor, but those other four spaces that we can technically also use those have to be filled in with other means. In this case I use multi-carting, I loaded them from a different cart, but if you don't want to use multi-carting, and I usually don't like to use multi-carting, then you might have to like encode it somehow in a string and mem copy it somehow. There's some compression algorithms on the BBS and so forth. But yeah, four additional sprite sheets. Mm. Now moving on, there's a whole bunch of sound effect features that have been included. And one of them is the ability to do uh, waveforms. And this is kind of similar to something that we already had before, but even more advanced and more powerful, I would say. I don't know. So previously you had like this ability to create custom instruments, right? You could draw a sound effect. That seems good. And then in a different sound effect, you could use that as an instrument. So you would press this button here, boop, and, and you know, the first eight uh, sound effect slots, you could use those as instruments. 
So let's just use this here. Beautiful. This is this is what I needed in my life right now. But this is not really a waveform. We just create a little sound effect basically using this uh, sound tool, right? And we are just playing that sound effect over and over again. What we can do now is we can really manipulate the sound form, the actual sound wave coming out of the speakers, more than just like a sound effect or like on a finely grained uh, time scale than a whole sound effect. So the way you do this is you turn this wave here. And this switches to this very different mode where you can now, well, you can draw a sound wave. So we, let's draw something that is roughly similar to a sine wave, for example. That, that's a wave there, right? And then here in this other sound effect, I'm just going to keep everything as it is. That is a different sound that was not possible before. In fact, you can go here and press space and listen to what it sounds like. You can turn it into a lower note, I think, with this button. Good stuff. Um, these things are... I'm not sure if I understand how they work. They should shift everything or pitch everything by one octave. But if I press it, nothing happens. So I'm not sure wh what this is. This the button does something, but this button does nothing. I think with this button, you have to redraw the, the form. But the problem is like, if you redraw it, then it changes also the form. So it's, it's a little bit, also the tools to draw the form are a little bit, I think they could be a bit more expanded. For example, it would be nice if we could just like mirror, like we draw half of it and it automatically draws the second half. It would be nice to have a grid, to have like a center. There's just some things that I, I wish this had. And something to keep in mind, I, I'm a little bit, underwhelmed about this. I thought this would be really cool. We could create like really crazy sounds that, that open up, you know, the, the, the space and what kind of sounds P8 can create. And maybe that's the case, but the tool is kind of hard to use in my opinion. For example, it's very sensitive to small defects. For example, you have like this sound effect and then just one line here is gonna make it very short. And suddenly it's very buzzy all of a sudden, right? It's changed dramatically into a very buzzy sound, even by changing just one column, right? So, hmm. And also I tried to ask people for like some examples of cool sound effects that are possible now that weren't possible before. Let me, let me show you some examples. This is a fishbone kind of wave uh, posted by Heraclum. This is supposed to be the vowel A. There is a delta between an actual A and what this sounds like. This sounds a little bit like these, there's like these human voice box generators sometimes that, that kind of sound like this. Uh, something that's nice to see is that those waveforms also observe all those effects. So you can apply those effects, not all of them, just the detune, reverb and dampen. Obviously not noise and bus, but you can apply them to the sound effects as well. Let me try out some other ones. This is Batman. Very similar. Here's a kind of like a sign function posted by Smelly Fish Sticks. Something that's weird is cut off on the top and bottom, and I'm not sure if that's bad, but it's a very pleasant sound. Even tooth function. Okay. Here's a wispy sound. Okay, nice and pleasant. This is called bubble. This is called buzz. Definitely a buzz. And then DeMorris posted this. This is an attempt to recreate the saxophone. All right, so we have some new functionality to create waveforms. I think we need to put this into the hands of talented musicians to explore the possibilities. If you have really cool instruments that you can create with this new waveform function, please post them down in the comment section. I would love to hear something really exciting. So far, most of the stuff that I've, I've listened to sounds very buzzy. Sometimes you get some nice, pleasant new sound effects, but most of the time it's just different variations on buzz.
Also, maybe something to consider is like those sound effects in isolation might not seem that exciting, but once you add it, like include them in an actual composition, maybe that's where they, you know, shine. Now, while we are here, I also wanted to talk about some other functions here. So this, uh, we, we always used to have like this cheat mode, right? Like when you're not a musician, like I am, you could always uh, keep the button control pressed while you draw a waveform. And that would make, um, let me, let me use a, this sound effect, right? So you could press the control button and that would make the notes snap to a pentatonic scale. And that would quite often generate pleasant sounding melodies. And now this functionality has been expanded upon. So now we have like this button here at the bottom called scale mode. We can turn this on and this allows you to customize what scale uh, you know, when you keep control button pressed, what scale will the notes snap to? Here you can see the actual scale, meaning that, you know, the notes will snap to, if you have a keyboard, the notes will snap to those keys. So um, here we have like a, a couple of buttons that allow us to customize the scale that the notes will snap to. So we have those three buttons at the top, diminished, major, and I am not a musician. <laughs> I have forgotten what a w h o stands for but it's a scale okay so these are presets that we can trigger and those will result in different sounding melodies when we uh, use this control button trick so let me try the diminished preset now you can see this some of the dots have swapped around and now if i draw a melody the melody has a more of a darker vibe more maybe like a dungeon background melody, right? This is the major um, preset. This is basically just all of the white keys on the keyboard and that usually results in a more cheerful melody. Right? And this one is, I think, even more sinister. Let me try this. So something you can also do is you can invert. So now you know, see that the uh, three black keys on the right, these are active now. And if I invert them, they become inactive and instead of the, the, the white keys become active. So now this is like inverted. We inverted the scale basically. And you get a different vibe, right? And then you can uh, transpose them, so shift them up or down. I think in this specific case, inversion and transposing is the same. Um, let me try this. Yeah, you can see you can switch between different, the wave kind of shifts along, right? I'm way out of my depth here. But I think it's a cool tool, especially for people like me who are just not, don't know what to do, but they, they don't get the results they want. This is a cool thing, just to press some buttons, some buttons and, and experiment a little bit and just draw some melodies and discover some melodies that might sound fine. Cool little addition, something I'm missing is resetting it back to default. <laughs> would love to reset it back to default when I mess around with it. Where's the pentatonic scale? I'm not, I don't quite understand. Like that's not pentatonic, right? Not quite sure. Let me know in the comment section, how do I get back to the original scale? And while we're here at music, I want to show you something else. So pasting entire patterns between different cards has gotten better now. This is my chance sweet buns. Let's say you want to copy this over into a different card. The way you can do this is you can just say copy and set it co copied one pattern and you can paste it in a new card and it pasted a pattern in a new part, one pattern, three sound effects, right? Sound effect, in this case, 0, 7, 16 becomes sound effect 0, 1 and 2. Because there was, there was an, this was an empty card, there was no sound effect, so it put the new sound effects in empty slots. This was possible before, but something that's now new is like, let's say I want to copy an additional pattern now, right? So this pattern three, uh, it uses sound effects two, seven and nine, this one used 0, 7, and 16. So you can see there's actually a common sound effect here. This sound effect number seven is used in both patterns, right? So now I'm gonna copy the second pattern over. I'm gonna put it in this slot. I'm gonna paste it. As you can see, one pattern, but just two new sound effects added. So this middle sound effect now 
uh, has been reused. The Pico 8 scanned through already existing sound effects, and if it already found a copy of that sound effect already existing in memory, it wouldn't create a second copy of that. It would just reuse the already existing sound effect. And that is kind of really nice if you copy a lot of mel melodies whole, you know, wholesale from one card to another. Um, previously, Pico 8 would just like trash the memory with copies of the same uh, sound effect over and over again if you reused sound effects. But now it will, in a smart way, will look for that sound effect already exists in a card and will automatically uh, use that sound effect. Useful stuff. Now, there's a whole category of improvements that made Pico 8 better if you are using one of these. Uh, the portable devices, especially the RGB 30, which is really good device for Pico 8. And I already made a whole video why I think that is the case. Now, there were a couple of features of Pico 8 that weren't quite working as intended with the RGB 30. And those have been, well, allegedly fixed. One thing that is new is now that it's easier to exit out of Pico 8, which is something that might be difficult to do on a mobile device. Previously, the way you would do is you would pull up this menu, and then there's no way of quitting out to the desktop if you're running things from Splore. The only thing you can do is to exit back to Splore, and then in Splore, you would be like, okay, you have to select a card, and then you have to go in options in this card, and there you have shut down Pico 8, right? It was like hidden in menus, and it's like not intuitive at all. But now we have a different option. So when you are in a game, you can just press enter. Now there is no quit in here, but you can go into options right here. And here you would have a way to shut down Pico 8. Now it's not visible here, but it is visible on a mobile devices when you launch things directly into Splore from the main menu. And there's also another thing that is, I mean, it's a little bit specific to the RGB 30, but it's a huge deal. So the RGB 30, up here, it has an HDMI out, so we can use this as a console. And the way you would use it as a console is you plug in an HDMI here, and then you would plug in an external controller. And then the idea would be that you can use the controller to control Pico 8. That doesn't, well, that didn't work out in the past. And the reason for that is that those face buttons that you have here, the face buttons on the actual handheld device, those count as controller number one. And whatever you attach to this will then count as controller number two. And that would be mapped to player number two. And so you wouldn't be able to control Pico 8 using an external controller. But now in the config.txt, there's a function to merge controllers right here. So it says here, merge joysticks, right? And that means that, you know, this amount of joysticks will be merged into one player, technically. That's the way it's supposed to work. And there's like an explanation here, like if it's set it to two, then controller number like zero and one, so so the first two controllers get merged into one player, into player number one. That's great. It doesn't work. So I have turned this on. I have a controller attached to p I, I guess just one controller at this point, but it's the same thing if you have two controllers. As you can see, it does the opposite, so to speak. It, now I can control two players with one controller. We wanted to control one player with two controllers. It's the, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. Uh, yeah, and of course, this is also the same thing if you use it on an RGB 30. I will show some footage right now. As you can see, uh, the face buttons control player number one and two, and the controller, the external controller attached does nothing. Seems like a small mishap happened there. Hope that will get fixed in the next update. But something that does work, and it's actually uh, not just a boon for mobile devices, but also for everybody else, is that See, searching got better on the, on the Splore. It used to be really, really bad. And one good example of how it didn't work or didn't work great in the past was Celeste. That's why it, Celeste is one of the things I have favored. It's because it's so difficult to find Celeste on Splore. Previously, you would type in Celeste into the search box and it would return the most recent version of Celeste, which would be some kind of ROM hack that somebody did. And actual, the actual Celeste, you know, which was created years ago, the original Celeste, that would be down on the bottom of the list. You would have to scroll multiple pages down until you finally find Celeste. Now, the results of the search in Splore are sorted by number of stars in the BBS. So things that have a lot of stars will appear higher up. And that means that if you look for Celeste, you actually get Celeste. Ah. 
actually the top result is Celeste and the second result is Celeste too. Mwah. Mwah. Moving on, the remaining things are small, but it's kind of like good to know about those things. One of the things that is new is that menus uh, can now react better to button presses. We have the option to add more elements to the menu. I will show you right away. I will run this program. As you can see, I have this test text show up in the menu. That's something I can customize. I can call my own function from the menu here. For example, here I will run this and it will actually show me some bunch of numbers. Let me print them in a better position. Like here, right? Good numbers. So these numbers are actually, um, you know, the when we call this callback function that is executed by this menu, we have to supply the menu with this with a function that the menu is supposed to call. I call this mon, my func in this case. My func uh, gets a number as a parameter. And that number specifies which button was exactly pressed to execute the menu. So something that you could do is not just execute the menu pressing you know, the confirm button, but you could also press left and right. And that would give you this kind of number as a parameter. So you could have like menus where you can switch between different options and so forth. This is great. This is great stuff. We already discussed this in the past. However, there is a bit of a catch that is now fixed and that is pressing left and right would still execute this function, right? So sometimes those functions would have things that are kind of spicy, like deleting your save game. And if you accidentally press, press left and right on that menu, it would delete the save game. And you would not notice about, because it's like pressing left and right doesn't close the menu, right? We executed the code, but it, we didn't close the menu. It's still there and you didn't see anything happening, but secretly underneath maybe your save game was deleted. Yikes, right? So we, what we can do now is you can specify exactly which buttons the menu reacts to. So when do we get this function call and when do we not get the function call? And you do this by adding a number to the number of the menu. So here are some presets that I have here. So if you do one and then you could do a plus here, you could do a plus or the or, it doesn't really matter. I'm gonna do an or, that's the pipe. And then this hexadecimal uh, number. If you do that, then left and right presses will be disabled. So if I run this, now pressing left and right will do nothing. It won't run this menu anymore. I have to press the X to, to actually confirm the menu. Something you can also do is you can actually do the opposite. You can make the menu only react to the button presses, the left and right button presses, but not be something that you can actually execute. And you can do this by do, uh, adding 7,000 in hexadecimal or adding or doing an or uh, on the menu item number. Now there's a bit of a, bit of a catch. <laughs> So if you do this, it still reacts to left and right, and you can still confirm it. Why does that work? Well, the thing is, this function renames that menu item, and that resets the number that is associated with this menu down to one. So in order to retain this, uh, this mask, this filter, we need to add this 7000 also down here. And that will result in me being able to press left and right on the menu to select maybe some kind of function, but I'm not able to confirm it. Pressing confirm won't trigger the menu function. A small detail that I also want to talk about, just quickly mention, this is kind of funny. It was possible before, but it was kind of like, I think, buggy. Like it wasn't intended, but now it's like kind of official. So you can do like an if statement, like if, I don't know, we don't have an X, but whatever then, right? We had like, that was the if statement. You could also do the if statement without then, but using do. Fancy. That also works. You can do do instead of then. And one final little update I also want to talk about is also in a config. So in a config, you have like this capture timestamps, right? And you can set it to one or zero. It's zero by default. That's the, you know, the behavior that we used to, but we can also set it to one now. This uh, just changes the way uh, screenshots are named when you do screenshots and save them to the desktop, right? By pressing F6, you can do a screenshot and that screenshot will have a name. And usually it was like uh, the name of the card and a number, and that number would just count up. 
But now if capture timestamp is set to one, this won't be just like the sequential number anymore, it will be the timestamp. And here is an example of what this looks like. So the upper two screenshots are created using the, the previous default setting. So it's just the name of the card and a sequential number. The lower two screenshots are created with the new timestamp setting. And so you can see it's the name of the card and a whole bunch of numbers that encode the current date. So 2024-0322, the current day, and also the current time. So it's eight o'clock in the evening. And this can be useful when, for example, when you're documenting the progress on your project using screenshots and you're putting all of the screenshots in one big folder. Previously, you had that problem that a lot of your screenshots would have the same names because the sequential numbers would reset every time you restart Pico 8, but now you will get screenshots with unique file names and those file names will even sort chronologically when you sort them alphabetically. And that means we are through. These are all of the major things that I really wanted to talk about. If there are some things that I have not discussed and that you would like to discuss yourself, please post them in a the comment section. Make me aware of the things that I missed. I would love to know what features you are interested in. And also help me out with those with those waveforms. I don't know how to make them work. Teach me how to waveform. I really love the inverted draw functions. This is actually something I already immediately started using in my in my newest episode of the Schmap tutorial that I was I just recorded. So I'm 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 super hyped about those functions. This is a really cool addition. I'm also happy that the RGB30 gets some love, that we have some like you know much needed fixes, a bit bumped about those controllers, but I, I have a feeling that we're gonna see an update on those very, very soon. But maybe it will take some time because obviously something that the community is really excited about right now is Picotron. Yes, a lot of people ask about this. There's gonna be a lot of Picotron content on this channel. It's coming up. Those Picotron videos are in the pipeline. They are coming up. And if you want to support my work here on this channel, creating all this new content, then you can do so on coffee.com slash lazy devs. And as always, at the end of each episode, I give a huge shout out and a big thank you to all of the people who are already supporting me on coffee.com. This also includes the new arrivals this month. So a huge shout out to our new supporters, which includes Annette, Arun Nagaraj, Brad Fabsh, Robo59, Yihil, Jose Vincente Medina. Thank you so much for your support. And also I want to answer a question now. So you guys, I posted about Picotron and you guys have so many opinions and questions about Picotron. It's crazy. It's like everybody is like, ah, there's a very short question here by Next Liar about Picotron. Is Picotron AOS? Um, yeah, like it's kind of is, yes. It's kind of like a pretend OS. It's, it's a desktop. Thing that looks like if it was an OS, in the same way that Pico A looks like it's if it was a console. It's not really a console, it's a fantasy console, right? In the same way, Picotron is like a fantasy workstation. So let me cook up those other videos. We will be back soon with some Picotron content. Otherwise, enjoy the new Pico 8 version. See you next time around, guys. Bye bye.